Hi, my name's Billy Martin. I'm a principal engineer for Cessna Aircraft. I've worked here about 23 years. Uh, I'm also um, a uh, specialist in the area of electromagnetic effects. Um, I'm a supervisor for the electromagnetic effects group at Cessna, and we run a electromagnetic lab uh, that does testing for her uh, lightning, etc. I'm also the uh, chairman of the National Lightning Committee that writes all the standards for lightning protection of aircraft, um, both all the way from a 787 down to a 172. So what we're going to talk about today is what is called indirect effects of lightning. Um, it's kind of a misnomer because there's not indirect or direct effects from lightning. Uh, it's really effects from lightning. But it's been called indirect effects of lightning in regard to the fact that it is induced currents and voltages uh, at transients and that sort of stuff in interfaces. So it happens when an airplane is struck by lightning. Now this is a uh, 747 taking off from Osaka, Japan uh, back um, in the 70s or 80s. I'm not even sure where it's, a, it's on the internet. But you can see the aircraft is being struck from a cloud to ground lightning strike. The reason you can tell it's cloud to ground is because the channels are going upward into the cloud. Uh, and you see both the attachment phase and the return stroke phase. So the airplane's being struck by lightning and all of the electronics, electrical electronic equipment on that aircraft is being subjected to large amounts of current and vote beach transients. So when we think about effects from lightning, uh, both direct and indirect, we typically think about directs as happening at attachment points on the airplane, but indirect effects occurring over the entire structure of the airplane. Now, again, that's sometimes hard to imagine, but if I have a avionics system in the nose of a 680 aircraft and it's struck by lightning, it's fairly easy to imagine that the entire equipment inside that nose, though I have a left-hand side and a right-hand side, is subjected to basically the same threat simultaneously. So that's what's called a common mode failure condition or a common mode threat, that all that equipment is subjected to electrical and, and magnetic field transients simultaneously. So, Indirect effects of lightning or electrical electronic system lightning protection, those result from the electromagnetic fields that are pursuant or produced by direct strike to the aircraft. So I take a direct strike to the airplane, and as a result of current flows through the structure and magnetic field uh, flux or magnetic fields coupling through the windows and through the seams of, of the aircraft, producing these voltages and current flows on the airplane. These transients produced by this electrical field flow into the aircraft interior, producing structural IR currents, as well as time-varying uh, current flows on wire conductors. And this just shows the various means of conducting. I have an aircraft get struck by lightning. It enters in the nose, exits out the tail, current flows through the structure, and I have a basic... IR drop. So I have a voltage produced by the resistance of the aircraft structure. So if I have a piece of equipment that's mounted in the nose and, and is connected to one mounted in the tail, there is a voltage differential between those two. The other way is through external magnetic field coupling. The aircraft struck by lightning creates electromagnetic current flow creating flux density that couples through apertures and connects on wire bundles and et cetera inside the airplane. Same thing happens with electrical field. The airplane struck, there's an external electrical field that's introduced through the apertures of the airplane, producing electrical field internal to the aircraft. So there's lots of documents related to how to protect this uh, airplane from lightning, how we define the air, uh, the lightning environment, how we define the, the test procedures. All of those are listed here. Uh, you can read them, but there's an environment document, there's a test document, there's an AC versus, there's a DO-160 document that talks about how do I uh, test equipment. So there's lots of guidance out there. 
So ARP 5412 defines the electromagnetic lightning environment. It talks it, it comes from measured uh, data off of towers, measured data off of triggered lightning experiments performed by University of New Mexico, uh, University of Florida, various people have, have performed those experiments. But the majority of that data comes from measured data off of light or lightning strikes to instrumented towers. Um, basically, that document is produced by a committee that I'm chairman of, the SAE AE2 committee, that produces all these standards. Uh, this just shows what the lightning environment is, and basically it's composed of several components. Um, when we talk about components, we're talking about electrical current, okay, so these are current components. Component A is the initial strike to the airplane. Component B is what we call an intermediate current. Component C is a continuing current flow long duration. And component D is what's considered to be a restrike of uh, the lightning channel. Component A is a 200,000 ampere uh, peak amplitude. Component B is, is basically uh, defined in regard to power transfer of 10 coulombs. Uh, component C is the same way with 200 coulombs. And component D is an amplitude of 100K. And this is a pictorial of the same thing, A, B, C, and a restrike of D. Now, this table is the table that's within the document that defines those current parameters. It's a, the test waveforms are defined as a double exponential waveform for component A um, and D. And so this defines the various parameters mathematically that are used to define those amplitudes. Now, when the that's the external environment. When the external environment strikes the airplane, then there's an induced internal environment. And that internal environment is defined as voltages and currents at the interfaces of equipment. So we have another table within the docu document that talks about induced transient waveform parameters. And they are given in various types of waveforms, waveform one through five and six. And they're given in open circuit voltages and short circuit current uh, definitions. So that's the external environment, that's the internal environment. What environments do I care about in regard to protection of electromagnetic, or I'm sorry, electrical electronic equipment? I care about three separate environments from lightning. And a lot of people say, well, lightning's just one environment, but it's really not, okay? If you ever watched lightning, you see, sometimes you see a, a large amplitude strike and it seems like there's only one strike that occurs. That's called a single stroke. And typically, single strokes are high amplitude positive return strokes, and they occur in certain areas of the world, like North Sea uh, in between England and uh, say the, you know, Denmark or, or Norway, the North Sea area of the Atlantic, or in the Sea of Japan. Most of those cases occur in the winter time when the sea water is below freezing and you have very low cloud cover down onto the sea. And you get what's called a positive return stroke. That's the single stroke. Then there's a multiple stroke. If you ever watch lightning striking in clouds and from one cloud to the other, it appears to strobe effect. And that strobe effect is actually multiple discharges going down the same panel or the same channel. And then there's multiple bursts. And multiple bursts is a phenomena that occurs at the initial attachment point of aircraft. So let's go into those a little bit more detail. The positive return stroke, or I'm sorry, single stroke uh, environment is based upon the positive stroke earth to cloud lightning strike. And it's the most severe type of strike that occurs. Okay? And the reason for that is, is that it actually, instead of the bottom of the cloud being a negative, it appears that that polarity switches and you get a positive earth to a negative cloud lightning strike. It's returning back to the positive return instead to negative. 
And the test levels for this environment are based upon the 200 ampere strike. And there's five possible waveforms that can be used to run these tests. And these waveforms are defined in the environment standard and are used in the various test standards. Multiple stroke environments based upon a negative cloud to ground or cloud to cloud lightning strike and consist of what we call component D, 100 kiloamps, and is, is basically one single amplitude uh, uh, stroke followed by 13 follow-on strokes. The primary purpose of single stroke is for damage. The primary purpose of multiple stroke is in dealing with systems upset. So I have electrical electronic equipment that produces transients. Um, you know, I have equipment that sends out digital pulses and those digital pulses can be disrupted by this environment. Now this is a triggered uh, lightning strike shot off from the University of Florida uh, on a triggered lightning. The, there's lightning in the area. They measure a certain voltage uh, uh, field strength on the ground and they fire these, these rockets off and create a triggered lightning. Now what the, the wire does is it takes the place of the initial stroke and then the follow-on strokes are multiple stroke environment. So you can see this on the same pictorial. This is a, a camera with its lens open looking at multiple channels going down the same line. Similar sort of thing here. This is fired instead of off of a tower. It's fired out of the ground, but you see the same phenomena. You see a single stroke followed by multiple channels going down the same plasma. Now, once that channel is hot, then all these different strokes can come down the same line. If the channel's still hot, then all these different charge centers can discharge down the same line. This shows the same thing as you see multiple strikes down the same panel. And then the final one shows the wire very clearly exploding and then up to about seven different re-strikes occurring down that same hot plasma. Okay. And this one I just think is a cool picture. Uh, it shows the same thing with the wind blowing. Now in direct effects we talk about the sweeping effect in regard to the lightning channel. You can clearly see that the channel is being blown to the side. So imagine if an airplane was flying, we would get a sweeping effect because of the mass of the channel being blown sideways by the wind. So how do we protect against those? Well, we protect against those like we do direct effects, like we do for HERF. The way we protect against it is through good electrical bonding, good wire bundle routing, and good wire bundle shielding. Most of the protection can be achieved in that manner. Good electrical bonding is by connecting equipment, okay, to the ground plane structure. In order to protect equipment and maintain that e protection, proper electrical bonding is required. You cannot do it without maintaining good electrical bonding because, again, it's a current flow. It's an Ohm's law, I times R. And the higher that resistive number is, the higher the voltage is. And voltage is not our friend. It causes damage, it causes arcing, it causes explosion. Explosion, arcing, damage, those in airplanes don't go well together. So bonding is the process of making the necessary connection from a piece of equipment to a ground plane to give good electrical conductivity between that unit and that unit's and structural ground. So it's not just a single point, and I know that we measure that with milliohm meters, and everyone wants to say, oh, if I got two and a half milliohms, I must be electrically bonded well. But I can take a piece of 22 gauge wire, hook it from a, an LRU to the ground plane and get two and a half milliohms. But is that a good electrical bond? The answer is no, it's not. It has a tremendous amount of inductance and a large amount of capacitance, or small amount of capacitance. What we want is a low amount of inductance and a large amount of capacitance to provide good uh, dispersion or, or lowering the current density, good physical area of conductivity. And by giving a good physical area of connection, I get an excellent electrical bond. So the best type of bond, metal to metal contact with as large a surface area as possible. 
So good electrical bonding ensures that low impedance path to ground. So when I multiply that current times that resistance, I get a low amount of voltage. So the potential at the interface stays low. But not only just at the interface to equipment, but also at the interfaces at bulkheads, interfaces at the firewall for the engine, interfaces at the firewall or uh, fuel tank, any place where I have a, a metal bulkhead, I want to terminate those connections as well as I can to provide a low impedance so I disperse that current flow and don't allow it to propagate either into the next cavity, whether that's from the nose to the cockpit or from the wire bundle into the equipment. So how do I bond things together? Okay, Typically there's four methodologies for electrical bond. The best one by far is a direct metal-to-metal -metal contact between two conductive surfaces. I get as large a physical contact between those surfaces as possible. And that means a flat surface with no primer, no other things in between them. Direct metal-to-metal. If I don't clean that primer off, I don't have that. Okay? Now, it's not always necessary to clean the primer off. Like on antennas, we mount those without primer removed underneath the base of the antenna, and I still get good capacitive coupling. But for lightning and for herf, we have to have a good electrical bond connection. So typically, we have in LRUs and things, we remove the primer, we connect them together, we seal around the peripheral. There's a guidance for that in the maintenance manual. Bonding jumpers are straps. We use bonding straps across uh, engine mounts, across high, um, uh, control surfaces, and a lot of times on equipment because we can't mount them directly. On the 680, we mount some of those MAUs on shock absorbers. Well, we have to put bonding straps across those shock absorbers to ensure we have a good electrical bond from the, the uh, MAU or Primus uh, Epic uh, box, mo uh, modular avionics unit, to the ground plane. And those shock absorbers provide an isolator, so we have to bond strap across them. So if you look on those, there's straps across each one of those attachment points. Uh, we can join structures together. Certainly from a direct effect standpoint, this is really applicable. We join the majority of our structures together with large amounts of rivets going through those structures in stringers and things that join those together. Those large amounts of rivets provide a multiple current pass for lightning to travel through. And as long as we're driving a rivet into an undersized hole where we expand that metal out, it makes good edge contact, it provides good electrical current flow pass and low impedance. And then finally, grounding equipment through the connector case or through some sort of, uh, uh, you know, dial pin or something, you can provide electrical bond in that way too. The main point there again is that edge contact. Um, Section 20-2003, uh, this is from the Model 750. I assume it's very similar for all the other ones. The bonding requirements depend upon the method of bonding being used. And as I said, there's four different ways to do that. And it calls out those requirements. Now let's talk about from electrical bonding. Another way that we do um, uh, protection is through wire bundle shielding and routing. Okay, not routine routing. It's impossible to shield against magnetic field effects for wire bundles without terminating the shields at both ends. Kirchhoff said that in order for current to flow, it has to have a closed loop. Same sort of thing here. In order to protect against magnetic fields, which the old right-hand rule creates a magnetic field, couples cross here, creates a current flow with the right-hand rule. I have a shield on there. It creates a current flow in an equal and opposite direction, canceling the magnetic field thereby maintaining a low voltage on the core wire. It's critical. You can't do it without it. Okay? You have to terminate the shields at both ends to create that electrical current flow. And the main, main uh, interference route for equipment uh, is up to around 400 megahertz. Lightning, the majority of that magnetic field coupling, that time amplitude, DIDT, is in the lower frequency ranges, 30 kilohertz and below. So you cannot maintain protection against that if you don't terminate shields at both ends, okay? So for most equipment, the most critical way to protect it against lightning 
is to electrically bond the unit and terminate the shields properly. Why is it important to electrically bond? Because that shield is connected at both ends to the connector, but that connector's terminated into the, the back shell or connector of the unit, and the unit has to be grounded. If you disconnect any one of those locations, you no longer have that circulating current. So it's critical that the unit be bonded, that the connector be connected and bonded to the unit, that the shields be bonded to the connector at both ends in order to create that circulating current path. So why do we, why do we worry about that? Okay, Because inside the aircraft, all these wire bundles, all these hydraulic lines, all these fuel lines are really nothing more than antennas just like your antenna on your car. They effectively gather energy in. And at certain frequency ranges, they do it very, very efficiently. At quarter wavelengths, they have gain, okay? And what is, what is directivity, what is gain? And I give the example of a balloon that's perfectly round. And when I squeeze that balloon, I don't create any energy, I just direct it in a different direction. That's what antennas do, that's directivity. It effectively gathers energy in at certain frequency ranges and it resonates. And by resonating, it drives large amounts of voltage or current onto the wire bundle at the interfaces of equipment. So we have to protect against that, right? So we protect against it by terminating our shields and by routing them properly. So terminations. The best way to terminate is a 360 degree back shell 38999 connector. But they're very, very expensive and they weigh a lot. And they typically are only used for very critical systems like FADEX or fly-by-wire system. The standard Cessna technique is to use a pigtail. And the pigtail works very, very well, but it must be maintained properly. It has to be attached to the back shell. The back shell has to be tied. The unit has to be grounded. We sometimes use the third one only when required to terminate when I can't use a connector, like it's a plastic connector or something. So then we use a, a grounding strap. We might have to pull that piece of box out of the instrument panel and disconnect it. So the bonding strap sometimes is longer than we like. But we don't build Faraday cages, we build airplanes. And so it's a compromise and each of these are compromises that we make to try to reduce the weight, to try to reduce the overall cost. The last two are things that should never ever be used because I've put this, I've incurred the weight of the shield, I've done everything right, but now I just drive that signal inside of my box and all of the things I've tried to keep out of there now go inside the LRU. In this case, it's an antenna and this is a radio receiver. So if I take an, a lightning strike on a, an airplane, it produces 1,500 amps of current flow on that wire bundle. It drives into a circuit board that's used to see milliamps. I'll let that blue smoke that makes it work out. So there's some uh, wire bundle shield repairs in 20-10-02 of the wiring, my, uh, wiring diagram manual that discusses how to repair and to maintain wires. Again, we cannot maintain that uh, protection if the wire bundle, the electrical bonding and the wire bundle shielding is not maintained. Okay. As I talked about before, RF energy is dimensionally driven. What does that mean? It means that the longer it gets, the more effective it can gather energy in at certain frequencies as well as lower the frequency. So by reducing the effective area of the antenna, you also reduce its gain. And so by shortening our wire bundles up, in other words, we terminate them at each of the bulkheads, keeping them relatively short. We don't run them through grommets from the nose into the fuselage to the tail cone. We terminate them at each one of those points, thereby reducing the antenna length for each one of those individual sections. That reduces the amount of energy that it can effectively gain. The other thing is, is we try to keep the wire bundles as close to structure. So we have electrical bonding, we have wire bundle shielding, and now we're going to talk a little bit about wire bundle routing. Right? In this particular pictorial, what we're looking at is a wire bundle with certain amount of flux density or magnetic field. Okay, 
and that magnetic field coupling gets worse as I move that wire bundle away from the ground plane. As you see here, I put it in that corner and I reduce the effective amount of, of flux or magnetic field that's coupling till ultimately I put it in a conduit or a Faraday cage. So as I move this guy off of the ground plane, I increase its effective area or loop area and I effectively increase its gain. So remember this picture when we talk about this example. What we have here is a lightning generator, a simulated lightning generator, that we're going to inject a pulse down this ground plane all the way down and measure it as if a, a lightning strike hit the nose of an airplane, exited out the tail. I have a piece of equipment that is in the nose and it's ground reference back uh, to another piece of equipment in the, the tail of the airplane. So I'm going to simulate a 200,000 ampere strike. Not, I'm not going to drive 200,000 amperes. I'm going to simulate. And I'm going to drive a signal in there and I'm going to measure the open circuit voltage that would appear at the interface of a piece of equipment. The first thing I do is I take the thing and I drive it way up off the ground plane. Remember that picture where that wire bundle was up off the ground plane and the loop area is very, very large. And then I don't terminate the shield. So I leave the shield open and I have a large loop area. I hit the guy and I measure approximately 10.5 kilovolts at the interface of that equipment for a piece of equipment that may be used to seeing, you know, maybe one or two volts or 28 volts for that matter. It's certainly not used to seeing 10.5 kilovolts. And even though it's a short period of time, it's a lot of power. So now I take that same wire bundle, lay it down on the ground plane, terminate the shield at both the ends. I didn't change the wire bundle. I didn't do anything fancy. I just laid it down on the ground plane, terminate the shields at both the ends, and do the same exact test again. And instead of 10.5 kiloamps or kilovolts, I get 99 volts. Now I can probably design equipment to withstand 99 volts. It's very difficult to withstand 10.5 kilovolts. So by engineering into the airplane, good electrical bonding practices, good wire bundle routing, good wire bundle shielding, I can effectively protect my equipment with minimum effect in the interior of the equipment. So conclusion was best case or worst case, I'm sorry, 10.5 kilovolts, best case 100 volts. By using these proper wire bundle procedures, electrical bonding terminations, I can get an improvement of 40 dB simply by taking the care to install it right and maintain it properly. So by shielding the wire bundle, you provide that low impedance path to ground, that and good electrical bonding, and you keep the, the energy on the outside of the LRU instead of driving into the inside. So again, it's not, a, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, it, is it required to shield every single wire in the wire bundle? <coughs> and the answer to that is no, it's not. And so as an engineer, I look at that and I say, hey, is it possible to take weight out of the airplane by shielding some of the wires and not shielding the others? So we examine the overall installation and we look and we say, okay, I got this wire bundle that's got 30 wires in it. Do I need to shield all 30 of them? Or can I only pick the ones that are really critical like data buses, things like that, and shield those, but yet at the same time provide some protection to the other equipment in the, or the other interfaces. So this is an example of a, a low, uh, what's called an LTA, lightning transient analysis test performed on an airplane with various lengths of wire bundles routed in various places throughout the airplane. But let's just look at this one. This is, uh, I think, a 35-foot wire bundle routed in the cabin. So I have a wire bundle that has 10 wires in it. I don't terminate any of the shields, okay? And I look at the open circuit voltage on one of those wire bundles. When I do that, I see it's about 4,500 volts. So now I hook up one shield next to it. Not that wire, but just one next to it. It drops. The next one, it drops again. Until finally I see all the way out here to about 9, I'm down to about 500 volts. 
Now, what that does then is that, as you see, this exponential number comes flattening down. What it says is that when I get to a certain level, it doesn't help me to add any additional shields. It flattens out. And I'm just adding weight. I'm not getting any bang for my buck. So by examining the installation, we can actually reduce the weight on our airplane, and we don't have to shield everyone. It's called adjacent low impedance conductors. So the conclusion, lightning is a very, very real environmental threat. It's not only a threat to the direct aircraft where it attaches and current flows through it, it's also a very large threat to electrical electronic equipment. Most of our airplanes nowadays are very, very smart airplanes. They have lots of electronics on them. They have lots of computers on them. And they don't like large amounts of current, and they don't like large amounts of voltages appearing at their interfaces. And so we fly into weather today that 30 years ago we never would have flown into. And we expect to be able to fly through that weather safely. I'm in the safety business. So is everyone else that works in the aviation world. We're in the safety business of getting from point A to point B. And lightning is a very real threat and a hazard that we have to protect against. And we can design all day long, but if we don't maintain that design, then that airplane becomes unsafe. So the majority of electromagnetic protection can be achieved by good electrical bonding, by good wire bundle shielding and proper shield termination, and by wire bundle routing. But it must be maintained throughout the airplane. Electrical bonding will degrade over time. You must maintain it. Shields degrade over time. Connectors become loose. They degrade. You have to verify that they're still in their proper working order. All are critical to maintaining protection. So that's the end of the lecture today. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, there are other ones out there. Uh, anyway, for direct effects of lightning, indirect effects of lightning, and for high-intensity radiative fields. Thank you very much.